This is Tabletop Deathmatch, a competition to find the next great tabletop game. It was entertaining. I don't think I would buy this game. Everything sort of flowed logically. Game designers from all over the country sent their prototypes to us at Cards Against Humanity. We picked eight finalists, and now we're bringing them to Gen Con, the biggest tabletop gaming convention in the world, where they're going to pitch their prototypes to our panel of industry-leading judges. One game will win a first printing paid for by Cards Against Humanity and be crowned the winner of Tabletop Deathmatch. Hi again, and welcome to Talking with Graham about a pile of stuff on a table. Today, we have Tavis from The Game Crafter with us, and the pile of stuff is a whole bunch of games he made. Well, not you directly, I suppose. Not me. So what, what, what do you guys actually do with The Game Crafter? So we have a website that uh, anybody can go to, and uh, they're able to print their own board game. They're able to uh, upload files, you know, art, uh, rule booklets, all that sort of stuff. And right through the website, they can build their own game. They can add game pieces to it custom packaging, and then basically we ship it to them within a week or two. So we have over 920 parts right now um, that we try to keep in stock. It can be a logistical nightmare. And so people can use this for like prototyping games they're designing, but then they can also just sell it print on demand? Correct. So the, you can use it as a private printing you know, service, basically. Some people use it to actually do Kickstarter runs. Other people use it as teaching tools, um, wedding gifts. There's just unlimited ways to use games out there. Thank you so much for uh, sponsoring the second season of Tabletop Deathmatch. Yeah, we're really happy to help. We're uh, obviously Tabletop Deathmatch is promoting the indie game designer and that's what the Game Crafter is all about. Next week on Graham Talks About a Pile of Stuff on a Table, we'll have a variety of Tostito chips. Thank you for joining us in this set we hastily constructed in a hotel room. Hey Matt, thanks so much for coming to show us Charm City Blues. Can you give us uh, just a very quick rundown of the game? Yeah, uh, so Charm City Blues is a cooperative crime noir adventure game. Cool, well uh, let me introduce you to your judges. Paul Peterson, creator of Smash Up and Guillotine. Annalisa Delfel, the retail manager of Card Kingdom. Rodney Thompson, designer for Dungeons and Dragons. Mike Selinker, creator of Pathfinder Adventure Card Game. Luke Crane, creator of Mouse Guard and Burning Wheel. And Sherry Spiro, founder and president of Ad Magic. Thank you for inviting me. Do you want to come and uh, set up the game and uh, we'll play through a couple rounds? Definitely. Sounds All good. Right. So we've got uh, Charm City Blues set up in front of us. Let's talk about the design of the prototype just for a minute. So I know we had kind of an email exchange. You were wondering if you should work with uh, designers and artists. And yeah. we had kind of an exchange and I said I thought yes. that you were doing a really good job with it. Yeah, uh, to hear you say that my stuff looked professional was uh, really nice. I have spent endless hours in front of my computer making this game. Are you happy with the quality of the, the final prototype and the, the art on everything? I am. I, I like how it came out. I think it looks really good. I agree. I think the, the graphic design is uh, period authentic and I, yeah. I think you did a nice job with it. Yeah. Thank you. So I'm going to uh, leave you to the judges and uh, they'll play a couple rounds and then Sounds we'll uh, we'll chat about the game. All right. Thank you very much. Would you all like to play a case that involves a bank robbery, a case that involves a missing person, or a case that involves fraud? Uh, you want to do a bank robbery, guys? Yeah. Let's totally rob a bank. bank. All right, sounds good to me. No, we're solving. This particular genre is not really um, seen a lot in the games these days, and so I think like with the, the crime noir aspect in this and the light RPG, it would be really um, appealing to a lot of people. We get the call that starts this whole fiasco. Some young punk just held up a bank downtown and is trying to disappear before anyone can ID him. We'll see about that. To catch the robber, we need uh, a $2 signs, a martini glass, and a book. Is there any guidance on table talk? Like, are we just able to... Oh yeah, it's fully cooperative. And as the game kind of moves along, you'll have to uh, cooperate to make sure you're getting to the right place at the right time. So uh, I'm uh, Harold the Bear. I'm a criminal informant. I'm going to move over to this here Southport Savings and Loan and knock it over. I mean, check to see if it's been knocked over. <laughs> I get there, pull the top. Investigation. investigation card. Test is an interrogate seven, so that means the seven difficulty? Yeah, so that's the number you're trying, you're trying to hit. So I just need to get a four or more on this die. Yeah. Nope. Three, that is no good. Okay, so um, my my failure is to lose two health, health points? Hit points, health points, yeah. Okay. And I guess we'll move over to you. Here we go. Uh, so, we, so when we're in a bank, we have to, before investigating a money location, roll the die. Uh, if one to four, investigate as usual. 
Okay. But, oh. Yes. Did, did you want to do the try to get the leg up first? No, we kind of needed to do that. Before investigating at all, so we haven't investigated anything. Uh, test handcuffs at a six. Success game one clue. So our handcuffs is a one, so you're going to have to roll a five or six on that die. Me? Yeah. Note that, <laughs> note that he moves that responsibility. I am the worst roller. Uh, one. Vegas, baby. <laughs> all right, so you... I didn't like Rolling the dice uh, being the only way to really advance the game. I, I thought there should be more rewards. So let's try to gain a leg up. Or, or not. Nope, not, not something. Nope. We, tried. we have one more action. What would you like nope. to do? Uh, doesn't getting a uh, failing to get a leg up end your turn? Oh, yes. no. it does. Yes, it does. Oh, oh, wait, so that's you can choose not to get a leg up. Oh, I see. That's, that's why it's dangerous to do it before the investigation. Mm -hmm. Got yes. it. I think his game is sort of too smooth. Every result has either the same success or failure, and he needs to mix it up and make it a little more interesting for the players. Oh, All right, so I'm testing, I'm testing fight. Uh, the target is six, and I have a two, so I need to roll a four higher, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. It's because he's an informant. He can't be trusted. There you go. Oh, yeah. All right, uh, so I succeed, I gain one clue. So you gain a clue, so it's one of these little things. All right, and that's going to go Good on there. Good right on the clue okay, track. So so we'll All right. right there. And then we put one of these closed cards on it. So that shows that you can oh, move there, but okay. you can't investigate it again. Right. Oh, you can't, so you can't drill yeah. down Correct. in a single location. Yes. One of the things that you have to do is find the different clues to solve the case or at least progress it. The issue is that that doesn't really have any impact. You then just simply get the next set of clues. My virtue is I am an insider, plus one to all encounter ability roll. So I need a four or better to defeat this particular ruffian. Ruffian, <laughs> man. Okay, so I failed that. Yeah, Is that turn. in my turn? Yes. All right, and then I'll... you have to move to another location, the closest one without an encounter. So that basically penalized him in action for losing. Yes. Yeah. yeah. The biggest problem I have with the failure in this game is that it is constant and small. Every turn you roll and your chance of success is small and you make a lot of rolls. And so after you make three rolls, one of them is a success. Five or six. Yay! Clue on the book. Good job. The book clue. Okay, now if anybody finds something that gets rid of suspicion points, let us know. There's very little that you do on your turn that is exciting. Uh, there is a process that you go through, which is nice, but you basically, the end result of that process is you roll a die, and if you fail, something horrible happens, and if you succeed, the same boring thing happens. And that's just not enough. If they can fix that, then they probably have a good game. Do, do, do in the bar, we find a fight, which we're going to get beat up in. It's, we are a great fighter. All right. Okay, what do we need? Sherry Spiro, we need to roll five or six. Five or six, here we go. A four, black eye. It worked really well. Failure has to be the most interesting part of your game. Failure has to be the thing that compels you to continue playing in games like this. That has, it spurs you on. It makes you want to play even more. If failure demoralizes you and doesn't make you want to play anymore, the game is broken. Or I'll just not play the game. <laughs> How many turns do you set out there? Two in a row? Two in a row. Twice. Two in a row. It's like a tradition. Uh, do you guys think it's fun to roll a die twice and have your turn skipped? Like, is that your idea of fun? I, I was actually just trying to make sure you all got a chance to shine. Thank Aww. you. That's, that's good. You have a very fascinating idea of fun. <laughs> very, very giving. I know. His, his core concept isn't bad uh, inherently. Like, they're, you know, a, a noir detective game. Uh, it has its merits. Uh, using Baltimore as a city location uh, has huge merits. Uh, but other than that, I would scrap it and start over. So there's uh, lots of variety in the things that happen when you fail. You can gain suspicion points and lose hit points and spawn encounters and all that. Mm -hmm. But there's no variety in what happens when you succeed in this game. Right. Is that positive in your mind? It was positive because in my earlier versions, whenever you succeeded, you also got a leg up. And it seemed like during the game, people would just have stacks and stacks of legs up and nobody would end up using them. So it was an attempt for me to kind of streamline it, but I'm kind of thinking I might have streamlined it too much. If I were making this game, and I've made cooperative games that are at least superficially like this, um, I would look a lot at what of all, I would think of all the exciting things I could think of that could happen when you make an investigation in a location. 
uh, all the exciting things that I could think of that could happen when you draw a leg up card. And I would make sure they were all in the game. Because right now, the thought process on what is happens when you do something has, is very minimal. And it could become, uh, once that full list is made, it could become very interesting. Every two rounds, we're adding an encounter. How often in your games do you see people removing encounters? Uh, people tend to not pay attention to them until the end when they tend to stack up, but I actually have seen one group that was really strategic about it and kind of have one person who is like, and it's usually your character, who will just go after them nonstop and pick them off one by one so they don't stack up. It sounds like we have a lot to talk about. I think we're going to kick you out into the hallway for a little bit and we'll hold on to this prototype and uh, pick through it. It went well. Um, Luke was very particular at kind of trying to tear my rules apart, uh, but um, all of them asked really good questions. Um, they kind of pointed out some of the numbers that I hadn't spent a lot of time on balancing. It, it was kind of intimidating sitting there playing it with, with them, but uh, it, it was fun. Yeah, I, I think it went well. All right, and Lisa, you were pretty quiet during the game. What, were you, what was your impression of it? Uh, well, I actually really like the game, but I like character-driven games uh, personally. This game would be easy to demo and would definitely attract a lot of attention. I'm pretty happy with the graphic design of this. I do think that there needs to be a pass to make sure that that each card type pops. And I obviously, if you're gonna have 20 location cards, they should have 20 different pieces of art, not not five. But but I I mean I felt that the whole thing, you know, the use of sort of muted tan throughout and 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 such actually worked pretty well for me. Actually, I kind of like, like the it. graphic design of the game. It's kind of you know, themed and at the same time it's pretty clean. Yeah, I, th I think this, I think it would definitely benefit um, at some point from the touch of a professional designer sure. who can clean up the typography and stuff. Sure. But the, like this aesthetic of like a piece of tape on a photograph, I think that's actually really cool. I haven't really seen that before. The, there's some technical parts of the graphic design like typography and iconography that just need a lot of work. And working with a professional designer, they'll be able to clean that up and put everything on a grid and, and really give it that last touch. But I think that the big design idea and the art direction of the game is very strong. It's got a lot of things that come from from generally really good games. I think Ronnie needs to speak. <laughs> this game does have a lot of games, uh, things that the games have, including the problems. It is not an invalid design technique to take things from games that you love and mash them together. In fact, that's pretty much every game and all of the other judges who claim not to be just remixing things are lying. There's a lot to like about this game but it's lacking anything that would prevent you from having one person dominate the other players in the game, right? right. And not, I mean, in a lot of co-op games, you don't have anything like that. I definitely this noticed is, myself, you know, like, oh, I think, oh, that's a good move. What right, it's a challenge that co-op games face, and this is not really taking any steps to solve that. Instead of just thinking about individual mechanics that have been pulled in from other places, you need to think about ways to make those work together to produce the experience that you want. I mean, you need something in a co-op game. I mean, you can live without it right but it is best if you have some sort of self-interest so that you want to not let somebody else be the general if you look at a game like flashpoint uh, the way the uncertainty works it that actually helps prevent a player from dominating the game because you never know where the fire is going to pop up right with uh, this game it's just sort of a binary succeed fail and i can try again and it doesn't really help mitigate that that player domination factor those two things are really bad together too i think it is a game that has a lot of potential but is still looking for its identity um, there were fun parts and there were parts where they were not so fun as well so it's very up and down but it definitely has uh, a lot of ideas that just need to kind of grow out and come to fruition. It's not a bad thing to say there might be the next Forbidden Island in this, right? right? Like that, that was kind of, I don't, I don't know that I perceived that it was so close to Forbidden Island, but I certainly thought it fit into this new wave of, of cooperative games and, and it looked like it had some fun stuff in it. And it doesn't have as much fun stuff in it as I'd like. I like the banter. I thought it was fun. Yeah, well, I, was it was good interaction, and I, I think that's the basis of what you want to have in a game, besides good mechanics, but apparently there's some issues that he knew about coming in. Sherry mentioned that she really enjoyed the banter the, uh, between the players during the game. We kind of talked a little bit in character, or read with an accent, or you know, kind of had a little, little swagger attitude. For me, when I do that in the game, uh, in, a, in a board game or, or card game, that, that a game of that type, I'm bored. Uh, I'm acting out to try to make the game interesting in the moment uh, because there's nothing in the game that's engaging to me.
I'm gonna. I think I'm. I'm gonna be the downer on this one. I think I'm, gonna, <laughs> I think I'm gonna go low. I'm very disappointed with this game. I think it's amateurish. I, I think it's kludgy. Uh, I think you know, wandering around this very boring map, making very boring uh, D6 rolls, with him unaware of the probability of, of a result on a six-sided die. Are you talking about what happened to Mike? <laughs> oh, well, yeah, exactly. Like I, I, I cannot imagine if you've playtested this game enough, having not run into that situation. Right. We were failing, failing. We were failing rolls, failing rolls, failing yes. rolls. Oh, we succeeded. Oh, failing, failing. Luckily, great. We get to re-roll a bunch of times until we finally succeed. That's an awesome ability. Or until you finally succeed or get eliminated from the game. So one example of a game that that is like this that uses failure in a better way would be Forbidden Island, where most of the time the player is going to have a plan, they're going to succeed at that plan, they're going to use their actions to succeed at their plan, but then occasionally a random event is going to happen that is going to create a minor catastrophe that hurts everybody's chances. The thing that contributes most to the grindy feeling is complete uh, uniformity of the result of success. It's like, yeah. oh good job, it was exactly the same as the last time I succeeded, which was an hour ago. So. You don't need 20 success buttons. What you need is variety in the success results and less buttons to press. If you're gonna make a game about Baltimore crime, you have to have read Homicide by David Simon. It is the definitive text on the matter. There is no other text like it. That book is about the heartbreak of failure in criminal investigations. I'm not saying that this game needs to be that, but looking at how failure works in the, in that that book and, and David Simon's narrative uh, will give inspiration for working into the game. It's like, you know, I like the idea that maybe it's just because of the wire or something, but, I, you know, the idea of, of hanging out in, in Charm City and investigating crimes is pretty fun. And so that's why when we don't get as big a payoff, uh, that was that. A, such a huge disappointment yeah. for yes. me, though, is that he, Charm City Blues, right? Yeah. I was so excited. As soon as I read that, I read the description, I was like, oh, this has got to be inspired by the wire. And yeah. Even if he shifted like old timey cops, sure. fine. Nothing. <laughs> the, the, the thing is, I, when I look at this game and seeing its sort of future potential, it it absolutely could be like the Forbidden Island version of Arkham Horror, right? Yeah. Like the same like positional sure. investigating and stuff like that. The thing is, it's just not there. All right. Well, let's uh, get him back in and tell him what we thought about the game. Matt, thank you so much for showing us Charm City Blues. Hey, you're welcome. I really enjoyed the theme banter that went on between the judges during the playtest. Thank you. Uh, it was cool to see you guys all in the spirit of the game. Thematically, I really love the noir aspect of the game, as well as the character cards with the differing attributes. We saw a lot of DNA of other co-op games in this game, uh, Forbidden Desert and Arkham Horror. And, and I think you need to think about maybe expanding a little greater than those games. And we found the failure uh, mechanics in the game to be problematic, particularly the lose a turn result. Uh, it's, it's not fun. So thanks again for showing us the game. We'll see you at uh, final judging. All right. Uh, it went well. Everybody said that they loved the theme, which is kind of what I was shooting for, and they enjoyed kind of the differentiation between the characters. Uh, they did kind of harp on the failure rate, uh, which, uh, you know, I, I kind of needed that pointed out to me, so it's something I'm gonna balance. The fact that my board game has been in front of these people playing it uh, is something, you know, you, you kind of dream about when you make a board game. So it's, uh, I mean, it's been kind of an overwhelming experience, but it's just been awesome to have the chance to be here. Mm -hmm.